Hi, I'm Haley Burke. I am board certified in neurology and interventional pain management. I'm here to discuss with you today about the purpose of interventional pain management and how it may benefit your clinic and your patients. A little bit of background about myself. I did residency here in neurology at the University of Colorado after attending medical school at the University of Texas. After residency, I then pursued fellowship in interventional pain management through the Department of Anesthesiology at MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is part of the University of Texas system. And since completing that, I've been working both in the private practice setting here in Denver, as well as in academics and serving on faculty at the University of Colorado in the spine and neurology departments. Two of my disclosures, I am on the Speakers Bureau for Amgen and Depomed. And our objectives here today are to discuss the benefits of a multidisciplinary approach to managing especially chronic pain and to list potential indications for a referral to an interventional pain management specialist and to better understand what procedures and treatments are available in an interventional pain specialist's office, uh, which hopefully may be somewhat familiar to you, some of which may be new treatment options, and to better understand which patients may be appropriate candidates for some of the treatments that we'll talk about later. I'll start with a quote by Albert Schweitzer. We all must die, but that I can save him from days of torture. That is what I feel is my great and ever new privilege. Pain is a more terrible lord of mankind than even death itself. And certainly this is a grave quote, but I think it serves to highlight the importance of pain management and the effect that chronic pain and even acute pain may have on a patient's quality of life and that being able to help relieve patients of pain and improve those aspects of their life and function is a terrific, terrific thing to do and something that I enjoy very much and uh, helps me enjoy my job and hopefully contribute to the well-being of most of my patients. What is pain definition? It's something that you've probably already heard earlier today, uh, but to reiterate, it is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Certainly we know that it's subjective for every person, it's going to be different, and that it's more than just the physical sensation when it especially becomes a chronic issue and that it's a cessation in a part or parts of the body but is always unpleasant and therefore is also an emotional experience. And that was the definition that was agreed upon by an international consensus as part of the International Association for the Study of Pain in 1994 because it can be described in so many different terms that it was important to really get a, a standard definition that would encompass many different aspects of what the pain experience is. So chronic pain itself, believe it or not, doesn't have a clear cut definition. It may be pain that lasts for three months, it may be pain that lasts for six months, 12 months, and some people define it as pain that lasts longer than what one may expect from a degree of tissue damage. So what's generally accepted at this point is usually pain that lasts for six months or longer, um, but again, it really depends on what the source of pain is in the first place. And we've been hearing about pain management more and more, largely in part to the opiate epidemic that is always on the TV and radio, but also there's an increasing pain prevalence and an increasing awareness about chronic pain issues. And why is that? Well, there's no one real reason, but it may be in part due to the fact that diabetes is becoming more and more prevalent, and this is a symptom that commonly goes along with that. Likewise, with, obedi with uh, obesity and many other medical comorbidities, depression certainly is clearly linked with chronic pain, and we've seen the incidence and prevalence of depression increase over the years as well. Clearly, this data shown here is old, but it's been an ongoing trend since that time. We're also living longer, and the longer that people are living, the more likely it is that they may develop acute or chronic pain during that time frame. And then, needless to say, there's an increased symptom awareness. So back in the late 90s, you may have heard of pain as the fifth vital sign. And that was an initiative brought forth to really help doctors treat pain more effectively and make sure that it wasn't something that was passed over. Um, but along with that came a cascade of consequences that may not have been anticipated at that time. So modern day pain management. 
Interventional pain management, pain management as its own specialty, is one of the newer fields of medicine, but it's the same concept has been around for quite some time. The early days of regional anesthesia and neural blockade date back to the late 1800s when Dr. Carl Kohler, who was a colleague of Freud, initially discovered the effects of cocaine on the tongue. And after that, we found out that cocaine was an effective local anesthetic and was an instrumental part of many surgeries when it was available. And this led to what some may have uh, estimated as an increased number of surgeries being performed. And we also know that it increased the time frame from which surgeons were able to operate. And this had, interestingly enough, some downside in the sense that the surgeries were lasting longer and, uh, and some medical historians have hypothesized that this led to an increased complication rate as far as operations went. More recently, Dr. John Bonica was a pain specialist and anesthesiologist who helped pioneer what we now know as modern day pain management up until the 80s and 90s of, of uh, the 1900s. And diagnostic blockade began back in the 1930s by Von Gaza and White. And this was really a, a highlight as far as the timeline of pain management goes because they really helped bring about the concept that it's important to find what the pain generator is so that it can be identified and treated with some type of sustainable or durable treatment modality. So just a brief timeline as far as pain management goes. In the 1970s, the International Association for the Study of Pain was developed, and this is an organization that is internationally recognized and continues to meet to this day. 1977, the American Pain Society came about. 1986, Dr. Raj published Practical Pain Management, uh, which was an instrumental book as far as disseminating important information about standards as far as pain management goes. The AAPM, the American Academy of Pain Medicine, was developed in the late 80s. And the term interventional pain management came about in the early 1990s officially by Drs. Waldman and Winnie. And many of the most commonly used textbooks have been authored by Dr. Waldman to this day. And in 1993, that same year, board certification by the American Board of Anesthesiology uh, was available. And this is still the same board of interventional pain management that physicians will take today. It is the only board that is accredited. Uh, there are a number of other non-accredited boards out there, uh, but this is the one that is only, the only one that is officially and formally recognized. So, Reasons to refer to a pain clinic, there are many. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but one common reason is that the diagnosis is clear and the next steps need to be taken by someone who specializes in that area. Likewise, perhaps the diagnosis is not clear, so we see this frequently either in the context of back pain or abdominal pain, and often for these patients, the appropriate diagnostic workup has been performed but has not yielded any clear source of the patient's symptoms and at that point oftentimes the decision is made to basically move forward with symptomatic treatment rather than diagnostic workup. We also know that primary care physicians probably spend most of their time with paperwork as many of us do and other than that in clinic they're busy treating a multitude of different problems from high blood pressure, cholesterol, many other comorbidities that patients may have and as a matter of, of time they may not have enough time in their visit just to address additional pain complaints. The patient may also be especially complex. The patient may require or benefit from controlled substances. All of those are reasons why a referral to a pain management specialist may be helpful. So what's a general rule of thumb if someone has a relatively acute injury Oftentimes, let's say they sprain their ankle, something like that, it'll get better on its own, and, and we all know that. But for symptoms that persist, that may be an appropriate time in addition to the reasons we already discussed. We can also help in taking the time to provide appropriate patient education regarding either the next steps of their treatment or why their symptoms may be occurring, as well as potential benefits and risks associated with recommended treatment options. One trend that we see frequently is that for symptoms that appear musculoskeletal, oftentimes those patients will be directly referred to an orthopedic surgeon or spine surgeon. And 
this is where a pain physician may be helpful because many of these patients may not necessarily need surgery and oftentimes those patients are referred back to us anyway so we can help serve as a mediator of sorts and help better decide which patients may benefit from surgery and which may be managed more conservatively uh, and oftentimes we're able to effectively help patients avoid surgeries which may not be required or uh, which may be unnecessary risks for those people. So I've intermixed some memes and comics from the internet. Here's one. I guess Chuck Norris isn't as popular a meme nowadays, but uh, I don't think this is true in, unless you fit that persona. So what is a pain specialist? It's someone from a variety of different medical specialties, most commonly anesthesiology, but also neurology, which is what my background is, as well as PM&R and even psychiatry, although to a lesser extent. And a pain specialist should be fellowship trained. And this is where I'd like to also highlight that not all fellowships that pain physicians pursue are accredited. Especially here in Colorado, there are a number of pain specialists that have pursued a private practice fellowship. And that doesn't mean that they're not good doctors. It doesn't mean that they're making improper choices. Uh, but there is a difference between academic fellowships as well as those that are non-accredited and not formally recognized. And likewise, to my point from earlier, many pain physicians will say they're fellowship trained and board certified, but not necessarily either of th those two entities may be recognized by the American Board of, of Medical Specialties. And, and that's, in my opinion, important to make sure that there's a certain standard met. And that's where pain management differs from many other common medical specialties because, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't very many interventional cardiolo cardiology fellowships out there that are not uh, academic. And, uh, and likewise, for many other interventional specialties where the initial background, be it neurology or PM&R or even anesthesiology, we may not have that procedural background. So I think it's important to have the, the assurance that a quality and appropriate fellowship training program was undertaken. So what does a pain management specialist do? It's going to be a little bit different for every specialist. We each have our own special areas of interest and all of us for the most part will treat spine disorders. Not all will treat thoracic and cervical spine. Most all of us will treat major joint pain as well. What can be expected? Well, an evaluation, diagnostic recommendations, a treatment plan, many Pain specialists will treat acute pain in addition to chronic pain, and just about all of us have a strong background in chronic pain management. Cancer pain is another area that oftentimes requires a specialist, and this is something that most pain specialists will hopefully be comfortable with as well. Oftentimes there's a little bit of overlap with palliative care teams. So this is some information that may be a reiteration of what we discussed a few moments ago, and again, the services offered by a pain specialist largely will be diagnostic, especially in cases where the etiology of pain is uncertain. Procedural indications will be something determined by a pain specialist as well, and most of us will be able to undertake those same procedural treatments. And as I mentioned before, some pain specialists really only focus on spine. Other practices are more comprehensive, and those more comprehensive offices may include treatment for headache, or more challenging types of chronic pain, such as pelvic pain as well. And then medication management is something that, in my opinion, all comprehensive pain specialists should be able to handle because that is what we specialized in, in addition to the procedural aspect of treating patients. For many people, especially by the time they reach a chronic pain state, will greatly benefit from a multidisciplinary approach. We know that there are many facets to the way pain is perceived for most people, and to that point, it's likely that more than one just modality of treatment is also needed. And so the multidisciplinary approach helps to address all of the factors that may be contributing to the patient's uh, lower quality of life and pain experience. And so we think about the unique and complementary roles uh, that all of us may play. So from a medication management standpoint, from a procedural pain standpoint for pain physicians, oftentimes psychologists, social workers, and counselors may be beneficial, certainly working closely with surgeons and with primary care physicians, as well as physical therapists, and sometimes the complementary treatments that we'll hear about today as well, including chiropractic and acupuncture. 
and each of us brings something to the table. So the biopsychosocial model recognizes the condition of chronic non-cancer pain as a combination of physical dysfunction, beliefs and coping strategies, distress, illness behavior, and social interactions, and it helps reconcile all of those so patients can hopefully achieve a state where they can act, behave, uh, and experience life a little bit more normally. So what are the goals of the biopsychosocial model? To maximize pain reduction, improve health-related quality of life, which there are even some surveys and, and research mechanisms to standardize that, to maximize independence and mobility, certainly to enhance the psychological and emotional well-being of our patients, and to also help prevent secondary dysfunction, and to that end, helping patients remain active in both their professional, family, and social lives. And this is a kind of a flow chart that highlights how all of this is a lot easier said than done and how all of these factors may be interlinked. I already spoke about some of the more common members of a multidisciplinary pain team, certainly physicians as well as physical therapists and occupational therapists to help patients regain strength, to help patients accomplish activities of daily living that they might not be able to do otherwise, to assist with improved range of motion, especially for those patients that have had a musculoskeletal injury or stroke or multiple sclerosis or any of those types of illnesses. Psychologists and psychiatrists certainly may assist not just in the medication management of some of these psychiatric states, but also uh, in providing cognitive behavioral therapy. Some people may better benefit from modalities such as the EMDR, eye movement training, and also pain coping, setting expectations and helping patients reconcile um, their current state with where they want to be. There also may be a role for dietitians and nutritionists regarding weight loss, which may be associated with many chronic pain conditions, uh, as well as an anti-inflammatory diet, uh, which we're a little bit learning more and more about as time goes on and how that may uh, relate with chronic pain experiences and underlying inflammatory states of these patients. These are other modalities that may be helpful for our patients when used in conjunction with uh, other therapies or in some cases on their own as well. I'm not sure what meridians are being treated for this patient, but hopefully everyone's still awake. So many conditions are treated by pain specialists. I mean, pretty much anywhere in the body that's experiencing pain, we can come up with some treatment algorithm for them. Uh, most commonly certainly will be back pain, largely affecting the low back, also the cervical spine, and to a lesser degree, the thoracic spine. Degenerative disc disease is something that will happen in just about all of us, given enough time. And disc protrusions or herniations. And neuropathic pain is something we see frequently uh, oftentimes in the context of diabetes or in the context of chemotherapy, and perhaps up to about half the time there's no known cause. Arthritis pain, likewise, is something that oftentimes will happen in many of us regardless of what we do. Cancer pain, chronic post-surgical pain, uh, patients that may have a very difficult perioperative course is another area where pain specialists may step in. So patients maybe who are already on a complicated uh, medical regimen before their surgery and, and uh, oftentimes it helps to meet with the pain specialist before their operation to set out a plan and establish care. Myofascial pain and connective tissue pain, post-viral pain, shingles is something we see not uncommonly. Headache, there are headache specialists out there and in Denver, all of them do a terrific job. And oftentimes we may assist in their management. So for instance, a large part of my practice is treating upper cervical pain, which may contribute to many headache conditions in a so-called cervicocranial condition. And in that sense, oftentimes we work together. Pelvic pain and vertebral compression fractures, that's a little bit more regional. In Colorado, many of these are seen acutely in an inpatient setting, but it's something that some pain physicians may be able to assist with as well. Like any clinical physician, we'll meet with the patient, we will do a, an exam, we will do a review of their outside records, and discuss what may be the source of their symptoms, 
and then devise a plan to determine are further diagnostic studies needed, what would those entail, and then to help set those in action. And so the idea of diagnostic uh, availability uh, modalities of a pain physician, that's something that I think is important for primary care physicians and surgeons to recognize is a lot of what we do is diagnostic to help determine a more durable treatment plan moving forward. So we know how common low back pain, it's one of the most common reasons, if not the most common reason that people will see any physician in their lifetime. And there are more than one types of back pain, needless to say. There's axial back pain, which mainly will affect only the spine area, be it cervical, thoracic, or lumbar sacral in and of itself, or radicular, so back pain that refers to other areas. Facet-mediated pain is one of the more common sources of both cervical and lumbar back pain that we see on a daily basis. And to better understand this entity, we'll take a look at spinal anatomy. Here we see pictures from a sagittal and AP view of the lumbar spine. Needless to say, the cartilage discs are missing from these images, but they do highlight the structure of the facet joints. So here we can see a sagittal view, a lateral view, and the facet joints are located here, 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 and they're at an angle almost like a shingle would be. And then from a posterior view, we can see that they're shaped in a little bit of a convex pattern. There are facet joints present on both sides of each level, both at the lower portion as well as the upper portion. So we have the L4 vertebral level right here, and we have the facet joints at the lower portion of that, and then how it connects to the L3 level at this point. And then each facet joint is innervated by a branch of a nerve called the medial branch. And there are medial branches that come from the inferior and superior aspects to innervate each facet joint. So here we can see a facet joint present, and here are medial branches coming from above, and then there are branches that also will come from below. And each nerve is actually covered by a mammalo accessory ligament at each spot. Facet joints, why do we have them? Well, because our spine is segmented, and that allows us to bend and twist and flex and move. And for that reason, they may serve as a source of irritation for many people. And we can see the mechanics of the facet joints here, that when we're leaning forwards, that helps unload the facet joints, whereas if we lean back, and especially if we lean back and rotate, that may increase the pressure and increase the stress on the facet joints in the lumbar spine, as well as in the cervical spine, with similar motions. These are true joints, so they are covered by a capsule, they're aligned with the synovial membrane, just like any other major joint in your body would be. And we have a nerve supply from the posterior primary ramus, so just a little bit of a, a backup anatomy review, we have our dorsal root ganglion that then branches into both anterior and posterior segments, and the posterior aspect will eventually become the medial branch and innervate each facet joint. And each medial branch is the primary afferent nerve for the facet joints. There, there may be other contributions from elsewhere, but this is the primary source of pain that uh, would be occurring from each joint. And then this is just another cartoon demonstrating a basic view of the spinal cord anatomy with the dorsal root entry zone branches that become the dorsal root ganglion and from the dorsal ramus that portion over by the left lower corner would eventually become the medial branch. So facet mediated back pain we know that it's been an entity of, of a source of pain since the early 1900s but it was difficult to prove this because we didn't have any imaging guidance and so blocking these structures individually was essentially an impossible task until the 1970s where we had uh, relatively safe radiographic techniques where we had done the dissections on cadavers, we knew where these branches lived, we hypothesized that this was a source of pain signaling from each facet joint, and with these new imaging techniques we were able to go in with needles and specifically block these structures to determine what their role was. So here is a modern day fluoroscopy image from what an intraarticular facet joint looks like. So here we have a lumbar vertebral body, lumbar vertebral body, and we can see the facet joint here which is highlighted by an injection of contrast dye showing a very clear arthrogram. 
The level above it right here shows a facet joint that is not currently being treated. And we look at this from a slightly oblique viewpoint for best access given the convex nature of each joint. Now, how else can we treat facet-mediated pain? Well, not necessarily just by blocking the joint itself, but also by blocking the medial branches, which we looked at in a previous anatomy cartoon. So here's what a medial branch block looks like. Again, those blushes of contrast overlie the nook where the medial branch lives, right under the uh, mammal accessory ligament right there. And this shows a block at the L5 dorsal ramus, right at the top of the sacrum, as well as at the transverse process uh, right above it. And that's a, a, a good demonstration of what you would want to see with an appropriate medial branch block. Now, in order to do these properly, you should use as small a needle as possible. So here it looks like we're using 27 gauge needles. You should inject a small amount of contrast. And then to be as specific as possible, we should always use a very small volume of local anesthetic, usually no more than 0.3 milliliters. Um, many pain physicians, I hate to say it, will use a large volume, at which point you don't know exactly what structure is being treated. If an entire milliliter of lidocaine is being injected at each site, it could spread forward, it could spread backwards, and so the sensitivity, uh, the specificity rather, becomes much lower with that type of technique. So low volume, high concentration of local anesthetic is most appropriate. So let's say your patient goes through an interarticular facet injection or what would be more commonly done is one of the medial branch blocks that we just saw and they did very well. Typically that benefit will be temporary. So if we're able to localize where the pain is coming from, we're able to do a radiofrequency ablation thereafter. And what this entails is using a needle that is connected to a heat generator and it will heat up typically to at least 80 degrees Celsius and coagulate the fibers of each medial branch being treated. Now, oftentimes those nerves will grow back and it certainly is possible for the pain to recur, but usually the benefits when done properly will last uh, at minimum six to eight months, more commonly a year or sometimes even years thereafter. It is certainly not without complications. So the most common complication is discomfort, oftentimes for a couple weeks afterwards. The needles we use for radiofrequency ablation are substantially larger than what we would use for the block because we'd like to create as large of a treatment area as possible. And people will have some neuralgia afterwards. The likelihood of long-standing neuralgic pain lasting weeks and months thereafter is quite low. It's about 1%. And what we hope is that with improvement of the patient's pain symptoms that they'll be able to increase their participation in, in physical therapy, that they'll be able to uh, stay at work, that they'll be able to go back to work and overall become a more active and productive person. Here's a picture of what a radiofrequency ablation procedure of the lumbar spine looks like. And of course, it's important to remember that every joint is innervated by medial branch nerves coming from two different locations. So you'll always see multiple needles placed when radiofrequency ablations are performed. And you can see here the tips of the needle are overlying that junction where we expect the medial branch to live. There are other types of radiofrequency that may be used, such as pulsed instead of a continuous burn. It will come in pulses. Uh, again, varied temperatures for a true thermocoagulation. We need at least 80 degrees Celsius. And oftentimes there will be some overlying numbness in the areas treated. So as we spoke about earlier, there are facet joints present in the cervical spine as well. As we can see, they're situated in a more horizontal plane and the medial branches will come across the waist of each level. So here is a demonstration of what a cervical medial branch block will look like with contrast present. Whereas here on this side, we see a needle in the intraarticular joint space of the cervical spine and on the left side as well, what looks like a joint that was already treated. So epidurals are another very common treatment used for all types of neck, back, and radicular pain patterns. And this is most helpful generally where the source of the pain is, is hypothesized to be either coming from an irritated nerve or from the disc itself. 
Um, epidural treatments oftentimes will partially anesthetize the facet joints as well, uh, but they're used less commonly for that reason. And where is the epidural space? It's the space basically posterior to where the intervertebral discs live and posterior to the vertebral bodies. So here, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but this whole area would be the epidural space that's not comprised of the spinal cord or spinal nerve roots themselves. And these are conditions where an epidural may be helpful, where we see a disc protrusion. Almost always when a disc protrudes, it will go posteriorly or laterally, right where those nerves may live because it's supported by connective tissue structures anteriorly. And then here's an axial view over on the left where we see the epidural space, which is highlighted. Uh, it is a small space between the epidural space and the spinal cord itself. Certainly it is a layer of connective tissue, including the dura, um, which has multiple layers in and of itself, and then spinal fluid, and then the spinal cord itself. And there are numerous approaches to the epidural space. So one may be from the side through the foramen, or it may be from, a, uh, from the interlaminar space, which would occur between the areas where the lamina live, and usually we would go underneath where the spinous process is situated. This picture right here is a fluoroscopy image of what a transforaminal epidural looks like. And what we expect to see is contrast that wraps up around where the pedicle is located. And then the contrast should grossly follow the nerve root pattern itself. And we call that a neurogram. And it helps us know that our medicine will travel to the appropriate spot. It also helps us know that we're not injecting into any of the radicular arteries. So years ago, it was more common to use particulate steroids uh, that were not full solutions. And pain physicians would go in and they would assume that they were in the right spot, but sometimes part of the needle may be in a vascular structure and there were a number of cases of, uh, of injury, including spinal cord infarcts, as a result of those particulate medicines. So uh, most pain physicians nowadays hopefully are using steroids like Decadron that do not have particles included. And here's a similar procedure performed on the cervical spine. The cervical spine is a little bit more of a high value real estate area because um, all of the tracks eventually from the lower body will travel up to that level. Our brain stem is present at the upper portions of the cervical spine and there may be increased vascularity in these areas as well. So it's very important that if these procedures are undertaken in the cervical spine, it's by someone who's very experienced and properly trained to do so. And likewise, especially in the cervical spine, particulate steroids should never be used. Another common source of pain is sacroiliac joint pain. Here's an anterior view of where the sacrum meets the ilium. And oftentimes this presents as, as uh, axial pain in the lumbosacral region. Rarely it may radiate to other parts, including the hip or sometimes anteriorly towards the pelvis. And it's a possible source of low back pain in up to 20% of patients that are experiencing low back pain. Here's a posterior view over here on the left. And it may be secondary to arthritic changes in the context of major trauma, such as motor vehicle accidents. It may also be a source of pain. And x-rays, MRI, CT scans are historically very unhelpful as far as diagnosing both sacroiliac joint pain as well as facet joint pain too. Um, Oftentimes, sacroiliac joints will look arthritic or they'll look normal, but that really isn't sensitive in helping us determine whether or not it's a source of a patient's discomfort. So we will use exam techniques, we will use provocative maneuvers when we see the patient to help try to localize it as a source of pain, and we also may pursue diagnostic blocks. And here's a picture of a sacroiliac joint injection as well as arthrogram. And it can be an especially frustrating joint to inject because it's very safe. Uh, it doesn't carry the same risk factors that cervical procedures or epidural procedures carry. But what happens is that oftentimes our needle will be in the right spot, we'll inject contrast, and the contrast will uh, leak to the side or backwards. And so that basically tells us, hey, if we gave the medicine at that spot, then the medicine would be unlikely to travel along the joint which we intend it to in the first place. So we may have to reposition until we find a tract where the contrast 
shows us an arthrogram, and that indicates that the medicine will go to the intended locations. The sacroiliac joint, too, may be treated with radiofrequency ablation. Oftentimes, that is performed by using standard radiofrequency ablation needles to the lateral aspect of each of the sacral foramen. So you can see these lucencies here. The sacral nerve roots come out laterally and eventually will innervate the sacroiliac joint. There's also a device called Simplicity, which creates a strip lesion and is sure to cover all of the um, sacral nerve roots that may be implicated. So neuropathic pain, complex regional pain syndrome, is, an, is another common uh, source of pain for pain physicians, although it may not be common out in the rest of the world. So this was a, a real patient that I saw maybe a year and a half, two years ago, and you can see that one of her feet is not quite like the other one, and you can probably guess which one feels normal and which one causes her uh, a fair amount of discomfort and pain. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are other sources of neuropathic pain, and, and we can usually treat all of them. For complex regional pain syndrome, it's also a disorder that may implicate the sympathetic nervous system, and that makes a difference because it means that there are other structures that may be helpful to treat. So, for instance, when someone comes in with CRPS of their leg or foot, they may respond quite favorably to a lumbar sympathetic block, which is present at the upper lumbar spine. And likewise, if they have similar types of symptoms in their chest, face, or upper extremity, they may re respond to a stellate ganglion block, which is the sympathetic ganglion for those areas of the body. So we spoke about other indications for a pain specialist referral. We see many patients that have had back surgery and haven't had the benefit that they were hoping for. Um, I know America certainly does more back surgeries than any other place in the world, and they don't always fix the patient's problem. Uh, certainly by no means are they a panacea. Uh, it's hard to find a panacea for any type of chronic pain issue. And we can help these patients as well with various other treatments that may include medications as well as other less invasive procedural indications. Neuromodulation is a good option for people that have had back surgery and have persistent pain, especially in the context of failed back surgery syndrome, especially patients that may have a radicular component to their pain. It may help with other types of neuropathic pain as well. And this is a spinal cord stimulator, and that's one of the worst possible names that they could have come up to name this device because it is not surgery on the spinal cord. The device itself really should not come in contact with any part of the spinal cord itself, but rather it's a device that is placed in the epidural space and helps interfere with pain signals. It is a minimally invasive procedure. It is a, usually an outpatient surgical implant. And it's a two-step process, so patients will undergo a temporary trial with a spinal cord stimulator device, which is placed similarly to an epidural, but instead of just injecting medicine, we'll place the leads in the dorsal epidural space overlying the levels that we think are most uh, likely to help. So for instance, patients that may have low back pain will have leads placed around the T9 area, as we recall the spinal cord ends at L1, and so we would target the lower portions of the spinal cord, whereas patients with neck pain or arm pain will have cervical epidural leads placed. And so here's a, an illustration of what percutaneous lead placement may look like. Um, this is a model of a spinal cord stimulator. The IPG is almost the size of a pacemaker, and for patients who have significant benefit from their trial, they will then elect to undergo a permanent implantation system. That device that looks like a little bit of a puck, it's not even two inches in diameter and will be implanted under the skin either in the abdomen or above the waistline in the back. And it can be programmed to have different functions. So some of the functions may feel like a flutter, some may feel like a pulsation, some may be very high frequency wavelengths that the patient can't feel itself, but they may experience pain relief as a result. And these devices can be turned on, they can be turned off, the intensity can be adjusted as well. And the reason we think that they work is all based on the gate theory of pain. And this is a theory that's been around for decades. And basically the, the theory was determined in 1965 by Melzack and Wall. And the theory is that a gate to pain sensation exists in the dorsal horn. 
and that governs the central transmission of neural activity leading to pain. Eventually, wherever pain may be coming from, it has to be transmitted through the spinal cord and then eventually to the brain to register in the body as something uncomfortable. And we think about nerve fibers and we think about the different sensations we may feel, such as light touch or a vibrating sensation or itching. And the fibers that carry some of these other sensations may be faster than the small C fibers that carry pain. And the theory of the gate is that, hey, if we can activate some of those faster, non-painful sensations first, that will interfere with the brain's perception of pain. So here is a fluoroscopy image of what an implanted spinal cord stimulator device looks like. And the general wavelength frequencies are, can be very low. They can be in the tens to 1100, and, and certainly they can go higher than that. There are some systems now going up to 10,000 hertz. Um, when these hit the market in America about a year and a half, two years ago, they were very popular. But at least in my practice, I've, I've, I've had them kind of fall out of favor because I've seen patients do better with some of the systems that have more programming options. But they may, do, uh, they may provide excellent relief for the right person. So um, we already spoke about how and why it works. Um, it can also block painful discharges. We know that it also may work on a neurochemical basis. And although this is a technology that has been around since 1967, we're still in the process of determining exactly why it is so helpful for so many of our patients. Um, and we know that it's not just as simple as interfering with the pain signals and replacing them with something that most people would deem pleasant, but that it also may work on a uh, neurochemical process as well. So we may think about increasing GABA, which may lead to some inhibitory benefits in the dorsal horn. It may decrease the hyperexcitability of the dorsal horn. And it's important to remember that these are all, for the most part, patients that have chronic pain. So uh, by the time they see me or by the time we talk about doing a neuromodulation trial, that their central nervous system may not be processing pain the same way a normal person's might be. There may be a wind-up phenomenon, they may be hypersensitive, and that may lead to a difference in the way that neurotransmitters are present and processed. And that's another way that these systems may be beneficial. Vertebral compression fractures, again, here in Colorado, pain physicians are less likely to treat these, but uh, it is still a, a, an oftentimes an acute and potentially chronic source of pain that is very important to recognize, certainly in the elderly population, as well as in multiple myeloma and cancer population. And it can be treated effectively oftentimes with vertebral augmentation. There are several forms of that kyphoplasty, where trocars are inserted into the vertebral bodies and balloons are blown up and then filled with cement, or vertebroplasty where only the needle is placed and then the cement is injected immediately. And, and oftentimes these patients will have instant and profound benefit. It helps not only just to uh, restore volume, but more so it helps because we think it helps stabilize uh, the shearing force on each of the vertebral bodies. We also see a fair amount of visceral pain, and that can be from almost any reason, um, pancreatitis, chronic kidney stones, and certainly musculoskeletal causes of pain, such as connective tissue issues, uh, tendonitis. Uh, here, obviously, is a patient that has pretty bad volume of kidney stones present. And for these patients, obviously, we would like to work with their urologist and or primary care doctor to help prevent this issue from ongoing while we help to manage their symptoms. So for visceral pain, there may be different sites of treatment. The splanchnic plexus may be responsible for both abdominal pain as well as flank pain, such as in the context of kidney stones. It's a treatment that can be done for anyone that has uh, pancreatitis or cancer pain in the abdomen. And if the initial block is helpful, we can actually ablate the nerves oftentimes through a chemical means such as 98% alcohol to, again, destroy those nerves' ability to signal. The superior hypogastric plexus and inferior hypogastric plexus can be helpful for lower abdominal and pelvic pain. And likewise, that may be treated with either a temporary block 
or possibly a neurolysis, typically by, uh, by way of a chemical substance. And then the ganglion impar can be very helpful for uh, rectal pain and genitourinary pain, uh, oftentimes in the context of cancer as well. Pain specialists also should be specialists as far as pain management goes from a medical standpoint. So we should be familiar with the various types of NSAIDs available, with tricyclic antidepressants, which many of us may refer to as tricyclic analgesics. And those may help with various headache conditions as well as neuropathic pain and possibly even myofascial pain. The SNRIs, such as Cymbalta or Venlafaxine, may serve a role membrane stabilizing agents, so we think about medicines that were initially developed for treating epilepsy, such as gabapentin and Lyrica, and how they may help both soft tissue pain conditions as well as neuropathy pain, and even NMDA antagonists. So these are going to be less commonly used. These are medicines such as memantine or even ketamine, uh, which may help certain types of neuropathic and chronic pain. And of course, opiate medication management is a, a, an important part of pain management for many people, uh, one that cannot escape the news of late, and something that uh, it's important to make sure that opiate management is done properly, and I know there's a number of other lectures today on this topic itself. So as far as opiate management goes, and again, I don't want to step on any of the other presenters' toes, but it's important, especially for patients who are on these medications for longer than a month or two, that an appropriate contract is in place and that these medicines are being stored and used safely and appropriately, and also that expectations are being set. Uh, now, these should be used, again, in order to help patients maintain function. Um, if their pain is present, and better controlled with opiates, but they're still not able to return to work or accomplish activity, activities of daily living, then the true benefit of the opiate should probably be re-examined. And uh, also we help to prevent further misuses of these medications and addiction issues from happening. And a typical agreement will usually include the following factors, making sure that controlled substances are being provided only by one physician in an ideal setting, uh, that patients will be responsible for their own medications. So uh, oftentimes with this population, they may overuse their medicines and then they'll call at the end of the day on Friday. So we need to make sure that expectations are set about the appropriate time to have medications refilled. Usually that will be in a clinic setting. Um, acknowledgement of the risks of these medications, certainly including accidental overdose and death, as well as opiate-induced hyperalgesia and some of the other uh, systemic side effects that may occur. Uh, the fact that early refills are really not appropriate with this category of medication except in certain circumstances, uh, making sure that they're stored in a locked compartment, not left in the kitchen cabinet or bathroom cabinet, certainly that they're not shared, and so on. Uh, also that they're not combined with other easily available substances such as alcohol, which may increase the risk of their use. At my practice, and hopefully at most other pain practices locally, we try to do some baseline standard assessments to determine a patient's risk. One common assessment is the SOAP-R, the screener and opiate assessment for patients with pain, the revised version, and it's a very quick, very fast, very easy to score gestalt picture of what your patient's risk may be. Another area of pain management that has become more prominent in recent years are regenerative therapies, and this is an emerging subsect of pain management that I think we'll continue to see more and more often in the upcoming years. Um, there are a number of different substances that may be sold as regenerative therapy, including plasma, uh, excuse me, platelet-rich plasma, uh, amniotic allograft, um, cord blood is another option. There's a number of different treatments that may be used, uh, alpha-2 macroglobulins, and there really haven't been any good studies comparing these head-to-head. -head. Are, the data is very poor regarding long-term outcome and large-scale studies to this point, but needless to say, there are many providers that offer these, and, and that's not to say that they're without utility. We just don't have the same data about them that we have with some of our more conventional methods. The premise of these treatments is that we can help regenerate or regrow damaged t tissue and again, this is all largely speculative at this point. A lot of the data is anecdotal. 
Uh, we believe that most of these are likely safe, but again, there haven't been the clear long-term studies to help confirm or prove that. Um, PRP, the platelet-rich plasma, is probably the most common type of regenerative treatment that we'll see out there, and it may be used especially for tendonitis uh, or joint treatments. There are some modalities that may be helpful in the spine, but it's hard to strongly recommend these at this point without the hard and fast data, although they are treatments that may be beneficial. And personally, I look forward to the upcoming years where we can learn a little bit more about them and determine who the best candidates will be, what the long-term side effects and risks may be, and comparing how these treatments will fare in relationship to the more standard treatments that are available for many of these common pain issues. Oftentimes I should also add that substances like the PRP are taken from the body's own blood or bone marrow aspirate, so some of them are autologous, some of them are not, such as the amniotic fluids uh, that are processed similarly to blood transfusions, and, and again, there's been some uh, question about the appropriateness of those treatments and, uh, and the benefit as well, so hopefully we'll have some more information about that in the near future. Here are some of my references. Um, certainly, feel free to contact me. You can get my email from any of the CPEP officials if there's any specific questions that I can help with. And hopefully this was a helpful presentation for you today.